thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and readers' favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 365th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. And welcome to this changing of seasons as we conclude summer or winter, if you're joining me from the Southern Hemisphere, and stepping into fall or spring. And with that said, one of two of the petite plaisirs that will be shared at the end of today's episode will be inspired by concluding the season of summer here in Bend well and deliciously at that. But as I mentioned, I do have two. And the other one comes from the inspiration of my upcoming trip to England. And I'm also going to share with you how you can see what I'm up to and travel somewhat vicariously with me as I'll be shifting how I share this information compared to previous trips. Okay, but what is the topic for today's episode? We're talking about good taste in the realm of decor. We could talk about good taste in general. We could talk about good taste when it comes to tutorial preferences or clothing or style preferences, but we're going to specifically be talking about it in terms of decor. Because a new book recently came out from an interior designer that I highly respect and admire and look to, and I'm using her new book as inspiration to reveal the truth of what good taste entails when it comes to decorating, adorning, and customizing our homes. Because it can sometimes feel as though good taste is elusive, but we know at the same time that it exists. So with that said, let's get into today's topic. Today's episode is about how to have good taste when it comes to decor, inspired by interior designer Heidi Callier's new book, Memories of Home. I'm going to begin with a quote that was actually found in a recent article about good taste. And the title of the article is Whatever Happened to Good Taste? This was written by the style contributor Rachel Tashan of the Washington Post. She writes, quote, Our world is dominated by algorithms, by data collection that steers us toward a limited set of products and designers who have paid for the privilege of coming up first in our search. The result is that our taste has gotten only more homogenous, more limited, end quote. And I begin with this quote because... What I love, what I appreciate so much about Heidi Callier's approach to interior design is that she began a decor blog, similar time frame as many people began decor blogs in the early um, uh, 2010s, and she stepped away from following the trends. She stepped away from creating and curating what we were, we were all seeing ubiquitously on Pinterest and Instagram 
And in so really just honed in on what she knew based on her life experience and guidance through her jobs and her work and her training to work, even though it wasn't what most of us were seeing out there, at least in America. And I'm going to talk about that specifically because a lot of her inspiration comes from British interior design. And of course, as you know, and as many of you are yourselves, I'm an Anglophile and my own house is inspired by the arts and crafts movement that began with William Morrison in the 1850s. So I have uh, I have an affection and an appreciation for what she is able to do in these homes across the country. So she is from the Pacific Northwest in Tacoma near Seattle, Washington. But she has worked on homes up and down the West Coast as well as on the East Coast. And we'll talk about those. And I also have included a handful of images from the book with permission from her publisher. So if you want to take a peek inside this book, be sure to to check out the show notes. So we begin with that quote that maybe we are being basically numbed to how to have our own good tastes. And today's conversation, I'm going to share with you eight ideas of how to step away from just stepping in line and following along and instead really cultivating your own good taste to know what it is. And so To begin our conversation today, I just want to talk about what it looks like and feels like to walk into a space that has been curated by someone who clearly has an eye for good taste. When you walk into those rooms and someone with exquisite taste has put it together, to me, time seems to vanish. And the primary emotions one begins to feel are comfort, awe, and appreciation, even if we don't know at all how they did that, how they created this space to create that feeling within us. Somehow it all just works. There's a symphony of hues, of textures, pieces, and details that appear as though they just belong together to welcome the residents of the sanctuary home each time they cross the threshold. Now, I can remember seeing interior designer Heidi Callier's work for the first time. It was the cover story of Rue magazine in 2019. She had designed a Seattle cottage that was guided by the charming aesthetic of Scandinavia. So a bit of modern and neutral, but at the same time cozy and warm and and that whole concept of hygge something we've talked about here in previous episode, and I'll link to that in the show notes if you want to check it out. But this idea of simple yet cozy, unique yet functional, and with thoughtful touches of vintage, which she is so good at, to create a feeling of nostalgia. And from touring that space, because I went online to to, to Rue's website and flipped through all the pages as you do when you find a home that speaks to your, your interest or eye, and I just was like, oh, oh, oh. And I became immediately intrigued with her work. And as I explored more of her work and more of her work was shown, she has a handful of arts and crafts houses, both in California, Oregon, and across the country, as I mentioned, as well as on the East Coast. And I just felt like, okay, this woman is speaking my language. And she embraces wallpaper, which to me is quintessential, traditional British cozy decor, cottage decor especially. And so these aesthetics that she incorporated remind me of English country, but with modern sensibilities mixed in for living well and thoughtfully. I've included a few links to various homes that she has done and the whole tours of them on the show notes. And the one that has the kitchen that I absolutely adore, and I have a feeling you'll see it and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You've probably seen it before as well. It's been ubiquitous on the internet. And you can also check out her entire portfolio on her website, HeidiCallierDesign.com. So as someone who also lives in the Pacific Northwest, as I mentioned, she lives in Tacoma, Washington. Part of my intrigue was her home base, being someone who lived in the vicinity of where I live. And I know these areas and I know, you know, a lot of the decor that I see in homes and places in Seattle and Portland and, and San Francisco. And I have to say that her aesthetic was not 
at all what is usually seen in Portland or Seattle, where there are a lot of modern trends that, to me, it never really captured the definition of timelessness or comfort or even warmth. Again, this is my preference. And so I was drawn to her because of that. And so with delight and immediate appreciation, I began following her on Instagram as she shares glimpses into her projects as they begin, as they are in progress, and eventually as they are completed. But they're usually on her Instagram stories, so you have to, you know, check frequently. Um, and so it is with her new book that was released this earlier this month on September 5th, Memories of Home, which is a portfolio shared in the pages of the book that tells stories, as she describes it, that are nostalgic, romantic, creative, playful, but sophisticated, and so incredibly comforting. And it is just with that description in her own words. I love this idea of playful but sophisticated. That right there, I mean, hello, we're talking about the Simple Sophisticate podcast, but the idea of intelligent curation, but understanding that people are going to live here. How do we welcome people and encourage them to stay and to live and to not be fearful of breaking something, but at the same time, not making a sterile environment or making an environment and that's thoughtless or carefree so that you don't feel that this is a home, but just a place to sleep. I want more. I want comfort. I want, I want to a sanctuary where I'm rejuvenated. And that is what she creates. All of the boxes in my ideal of what a sanctuary would entail are ticked, are marked, are checked with this sentence of her description. And indeed, each of her homes showcased in this book, Memories of Home, demonstrates her objectives have been met. They've met her desired results. And with each client's home, she has done it again and again and again. And she even includes two of her own homes. She has her family home that she she decorated and walks through. She also has a family getaway home that she decorated that's the at the end of the book. And so you get to see how she continually, while making unique spaces for the individual people that live in these spaces, brings consistent ethos to each of them. And so as I'm reading this book and I've been following her, I'm like, okay, she clearly has good taste. What is it about her? How can we learn from her? And then I read this article that I mentioned just a second ago about what has happened to good taste. I was like, Let's, that's what we're going to talk about today. So as timing would have it, it all just worked out. Her book being released in the 5th, the article coming out the end of August. And as I was pouring through the pages of Heidi's new book, it's just immediately clear she understands and brings forth good taste in each of her home designs. And how does one do that is the question. Even if we don't hire someone or, un- or are unable to work with the talent and expert Heidi provides, how do we curate a home and in very much the same way curate a wardrobe and a life that is not guided by algorithms, as the quote we began this conversation with states. How do we do that? Well, I think the question in and of itself is a great place to start. So let's take a look at the eight key aspects of curating good taste when it comes to our decor. Number one is, speaking of the algorithms, as we just mentioned, be aware that the algorithms exist and begin to set yourself free of them. So generally speaking, most of us know that algorithms exist and by liking something, following a particular person, influencer, or channel on any of the social media that we, that we are on, more of similar content is funneled our way. We're talking social media, as I mentioned, on platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, etc., as well as what we do online when shopping, reading, searching, our web browser, for instance, Google or any others, unless it's one that blocks things, is definitely going to pay attention to what you're searching for. And then whatever you click on will then dictate that as well. And so, as we know, this happens when we watch different things on various streaming platforms. They try to give us more of the same based on whatever that particular show is categorized as. Algorithms are everywhere and, and seemingly trying to give us what we want. So, I mean, they can be something that is very helpful. I mean, I have to say I found some great films this way. Um, on Amazon Prime or Netflix, a lot of new French films pop up because I watched a lot of French films, foreign films, things like that. So yes, they're trying to give us what we want. But when it comes to curating good taste, it can make us all pretty beige in our choices. 
and, and how do we step away from algorithms or, or work with them and avoid being pigeonholed or limited to being exposed to new ideas that we maybe have never seen, but that will then teach us something or reveal something to us? How, does, how do we do that? Well, one way I do it, just very analog way of doing it, is to do, read an actual newspaper. I mean, hold a newspaper in my hand. On the weekends, I have my weekend newspaper from the Financial Times, from the Wall Street Journal, and from the New York Times. I hold them in my hand. I go through them that way because then I actually am exposed to everything that's there. And some of it may speak to me, some it may not, but I'm not just looking at a certain section or looking at a certain list after I've searched for a particular person or topic or theme. I see it all. I have a smorgasbord, I guess you could say, of options. And so this basically removes the filter. I've limited it a little bit by choosing particular newspapers, but I'm going through every section. I'm also very thoughtful about what I do like or love on social media accounts because I know it will then procure more and more of similar content. And often what I am liking isn't necessarily or always what will be shown more of to me. What I'm often liking is something that 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 person stands for and maybe it's not so directly shared in that image and I'm just saying hello or appreciating their work or their efforts. Sometimes it is because a photo is just so beautiful. But often, for example, I'll use this example, you know, I post with my dogs on Instagram and social media. And so it is amazing how many dog and animal feeds come my way. I don't follow those feeds. I'm not interested in following those feeds. I am looking for something different. But again, the algorithm says, wait a second, you're posting this, you say dog in your line, you say whatever it is. And so it's, it's doing its job, but my intentions are not what they understand to, to be. So understanding how our, our algorithms work, working with them to get what you would like, but also letting yourself be a little bit more open-minded to explore and to not be so hemmed in by the filter. There are also a few other specific ways, if you're a regular social media user, to adjust the, the settings on your account. And Mashable wrote a great article on this, and I've linked it on the show notes if you want to check it out. I want to conclude with a quote from the article, and she writes... Those who exhibit good taste in their home decor suggest a passion for living in a way that is ambivalent to the confines of Instagram's frame or TikTok's editing preferences. The point is that the inhabitant likes it, whether an audience might aspire to live there or copy their every choice is decidedly not the point. And that I think right there is important to keep in mind. You don't, you're not doing something to defy and be, to be contrary, you're simply doing it because it speaks to you and you know why it speaks to you, which we'll talk more specifically about that in a second. So the key thing here is you're not doing it to get likes. That's important. All right. So number one is to understand, be aware of the algorithms and then begin to set yourself free of them. Number two, travel broadly and stay and visit various accommodations, museums, shops, homes, etc. So in her book, Heidi shares in her introduction that she traveled and lived in a myriad of places around the world, both as a young girl with her family and then as an adult. And, and this is throughout the world, but also United States. And she began to realize she was drawn to the interiors of homes in the world of design, which then inspired her to start her design blog or decor blog. And she clearly began to catalog mentally all that she had experienced. And no doubt this played a a helpful role in offering perspective and insight beyond the boundaries of a particular region or town that a client might live. And this is something that I shared in my interview with Anita Joyce on her podcast, Decorating Tips and Tricks. So much of why and how I decorate my own home is inspired greatly by, as I mentioned earlier, England's arts and crafts movement, but also provincial country aesthetic and coastal cozy. How I decorate my home has everything to do with each of these places that I have visited and stayed at over the last 20 plus years of travel, both around the States and in particular and specifically in France and England. So whether consciously or unconsciously, we are going to be drawn to certain aesthetics. 
when we travel and it is when we become aware of our inclinations and what provides comfort. What is it that's creating the comfort in this space? What is it that makes me feel good in this space? What if it makes me feel at home when I am away from home? This is when we begin to home in, pun intended, but not really, on a on good taste that will also speak to our predilections of welcome and comfort. So when you begin to consciously pay attention when you're when you're traveling, when you're outside of your home and your regular routine and you're paying attention to the decor and, and the aesthetics, then you're gonna start to realize how and why things work and speak to you. All right, so that's number two. Travel broadly to expand and deepen and understand what good taste is. Number three, straddle two opposing approaches and find what they have in common. What do I mean by this? In her book, Heidi shares that she, quote, discovered a love of tension, a play between masculine and feminine, old and new, modern and traditional, unexpected but rooted in tradition and also layered and eclectic, mixing patterns, combining florals with graphic lines and shapes, end quote. And this is where experience and talent come together to create what Heidi does, in my opinion, to perfection. Finding the balance between two opposing approaches is not initially easy. This is why you travel. See how it works when others who have more experience do it well. Often when we see something that doesn't work or feels off to our eye, it is because the balance has not properly been struck. And it really is a dance, but a dance that becomes easier with practice and experience of seeing it frequently in the work of others who know how to do it. So for me and my approach to decorating and customizing my home, which I've named Le Papillon, pairing prints was a lesson and skill I wanted to learn because to me, that is what creates the comfort yet the sophisticated look of English interiors that I am drawn to that makes me feel at home. And so I looked to two women in the industry, the interior design industry, that clearly knew what they were doing when it comes to prints. Rita Koenig, British interior designer, and Heidi Callier, who we're talking about today. And I, I continue to follow both of their works. I took Rita's online course, which I've talked about repeatedly here on the podcast, on the blog, and I'll link to the lessons I learned from that course. I wrote a detailed post about it. And now I'm reading Heidi's book and it just, it's coming more clearly to me why what she does works so well. Now she doesn't give away all the secrets. You have to really look at each room and, and read her notes about it to kind of get an indirect idea of what's working and what's not. But again, exposure. Just keep exposing your eye to what you love. So that's number three. Straddle two opposing approaches and find what they have in common so that they can work together. Number four, understand how the power of textures and colors create warmth and also complement heavy dark spaces or details. And I'll explain what I mean by the heavy or dark details. So the cover photo of Heidi Callier's book, Memories of Home, it's an arts and crafts home in Berkeley, California. And Callier explains how they use linen on the walls to soften the contrast with the original dark wood that they were definitely going to keep. After all, that's very traditional to arts and crafts home to have wood panels on the walls, especially the you know, from the ground to at least halfway up the wall or a third, sometimes two thirds up. So yep, you heard that correctly. She put linen wallpaper on the walls. So not only does it provide texture in a solid hue, as you'll see when you look at the cover of the book, it also provides a softness. That's the power of the linen choice. And because of the light color of the linen, it brightens what would be a traditionally dark room because it's arts and crafts and the wood paneling. Thus, the balance of unexpected with traditional. In that same room that also extends into the dining room, she painted the ceiling blush. But to read the word blush in the description as you're looking at the picture, you might think, you know, just by reading it, you might think, no, not in a dining room, don't put blush. But yet again, when you look at the picture, when you step into that room, when the pieces are brought together, wow, do they complement each other? And it just makes, you're like, of course that works. <laughs> and so I almost guarantee you don't look at the ceiling, first of all, when you walk into this room, 
You look at the room, you look at this entire room and it is magnificent. And you're immediately thinking this just works. It just comes together. And yeah, the ceiling's color choice plays a role in making it all come together. So that's number four. Once you start to understand the power both of textures and colors and how they can create warmth and work to complement and balance out heavier pieces, then you're on your way to really honing in on what good taste is. So I have four more key ideas of how to create and understand and then create in your own home good taste. But first I have a sponsor I'd like to introduce you to. I'll be right back. You know that feeling when you get home from a long day and immediately want to take off your bra. With Honey Love, you'll never experience that again. Their bras are so comfortable, you'll forget you're wearing them. You may even sleep in them. Honey Love's bestseller, Crossover Bra, is so comfortable, it's sure to be your new go-to. This bra gives all the support of traditional bras without using any underwires. Yep, you heard me correctly. No uncomfortable underwires. I have had those bras where, oh my gosh, it just pokes into you or because you have had a long day, you just start to feel your bra more and more by the end. And it doesn't help because you're more and more exhausted and it just becomes super uncomfortable. No more with Honey Love's crossover bra. They make it comfortable, but they also add a touch of sexy by adding mesh detailing. This is the one bra you actually enjoy wearing and won't want to take off. And if you are tired of bras that cause bulging in the back, Honey Loves bras are designed with back smoothing fabric to prevent bra bulge. For the more relaxed lounge bra, I recommend their V bra. It offers the support of a traditional bra without the uncomfortable underwire. It's designed to lift and separate with molded cups and it's not a shelf life bra that creates a uniboob effect. But it doesn't stop there. Honey Love has more than just bras. They have incredibly comfortable shapewear, tanks, and leggings for everyday support. Pair your V bra with their breathable and versatile leggings or get the matching shapewear to your crossover bra. Honey Love has you covered for the everyday look, workouts, weddings, and more. So why not treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash simple. It is just that simple. Use the exclusive link for the Simple Sophisticate show and receive 20% off. Go to honeylove.com slash simple and take your comfort to the next level. You'll forget you're wearing it and look great with whatever you enjoy wearing. That's honeylove.com slash simple. Welcome back. Let's get back into our list of how to have good taste when it comes to our decor. Number five is seek out and bravely purchase antiques and vintage one of a kind finds. Throughout each of Heidi's client's homes, antiques and vintage vines are sprinkled about with consideration. And as she writes, there is only one when it comes to these vintage and antique treasures. So when it's gone, it's gone. This is what taste is about. Bravery, but not rash bravery to wow the crowds or gain attention. Actually, it is the reverse. Bravery to purchase something that speaks to you, complements what you love in your home, and the design your house has provided regardless of whether someone else will approve. The aforementioned article begins by talking about taste with a conversation centered around Jenna Lyons, whose sartorial as well as decor design choices are most definitely ones of taste, as it's not about labels. It's about adorning her personality, her lifestyle, and honoring what she has learned about what makes an outfit sing. Arguably, her expertise carries over into how to pull together a room, and her decor harmonizes and wows the eye in the best possible of ways. The first step in being able to be brave and to purchase vintage pieces is to know what a room needs. Where are the gaps? What textures or fabrics would complement what is already chosen and present in the room that you're going to keep? I have shared that in each room I decorate, I make sure I am clear about the star in that room. So whether it's a piece of furniture, whether it's the view I'm framing the window and the view that looks out, something has got to be the star. 
And this then lets the other pieces simply support it. So in some cases, such as my tulip chair in my primary bedroom, I have had that vintage piece for over 20 years. And then I just had to figure out, first of all, how to upholster it. So it was the star of the show. And then the other pieces really all drew inspiration from the the fabric that I chose from that chair. Knowing this is going to make it easier for you to 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 purchase that item that is unique, different, catches your eye, but maybe a tad expensive. They don't always have to be super expensive, but often they are going to be an investment. And so our homes become our sanctuary in time. Creating a sanctuary involves careful consideration and wisdom of ourselves. And part of the reason I so enjoy treasure hunting, whether at Brocons while I'm in France or antique shops here in Bend or in England, is because while I may not find anything at all, I could find something rather special. And in time, the feeling of our homes being our sanctuary begins to occur as we fill those gaps, as we find those special items. And that's what makes this journey fun. I've included a picture of an antique marble sink that Heidi put into a powder room, um, into a, a home she designed in Pittsfield. And it, with the wallpaper, with the, the vintage uh, rattan framed uh, mirror, it's just, it's actually a fairly simple room, but it has elements that just work together, even though there would be no prescription on how to pull that together, except for knowing what works. So that's number five. Seek out and bravely purchase antiques and vintage one-of-a-kind finds. Number six, the power of wallpaper, knowing where and how to use it. So this is a frequently discussed topic here on the podcast and the blog. And as a lover of wallpaper myself, I have five, six rooms of wallpaper. I always appreciate learning more from those who use it oh so well. And Heidi Callier is one such person. And in fact, in the tour of the Pittsfield home that's in the book, one of her favorite usages of wallpaper is in the entryway. And she also includes it in a few other spaces. And I'll let the quote explain why she does what she does and what she chose. Quote, Small print wallpaper in many of the home's common spaces, including the vestibule, the hallways, and the stairwell, brings charm to often overlooked areas. Using this wallpaper liberally, even near the back entrance, creates a beautiful flow and that comforting cocoon sensation throughout. And I've included a picture of it on the show notes so you can see what, I'm, what we're talking about when we say small print wallpaper. And to me, what I'm looking at when I see this small print wallpaper is it's not minuscule, but there's nothing garish or grand or, or an overwhelming color theme or mural. It's, it's a print that's repeated throughout and it's a very simple color scheme. So green and ivory. A beautiful soft green though. Um, Anyway, so the idea of using wallpaper to bring attention to places that are overlooked and knowing what type of wallpaper to use is definitely a sign that you are definitely polishing your good taste muscle. (laughs) So number seven, let's move on, is about investing in built-ins. So one of the most known and recognized and loved photos showcasing Heidi's work, and you have no doubt I have a feeling you have seen it around the web over the past 10, 12 years, is the green kitchen with the hexagonal terracotta tile flooring. In fact, this is her home that she shares with her husband and twin boys, and it's a Tudor in North Tacoma located in a historic neighborhood, and it is in each room throughout her house that you see her expert eye both have fun but also bring a timeless feeling of cozy and welcome. However, it isn't so much about the fact that the kitchen is painted in a lovely calming hue, but it's the kitchenette banquette. So these are attached to the wall. These are built into the wall. The cushions are attached to the wall. She did not go out and buy a bench and just snuggle it into this corner And this is what creates the kitchen nook seating. And she shares that, quote, you can only take a room so far with furniture. So by definition, you can't take built-ins with you when you move. But that is actually the point. Customize this home that you live in for you and what this house gives you 
When we work with what the walls and the nooks and the corners of a house we call home give us, we begin to make it even more a space that really functions well and also reaches its full potential. I've included a picture of built-in bookshelves that she installed at a Fox Island home that's in a library and workspace. A very simple idea, but again, it's this entire wall that's full of bookshelves, but they're built in, so they're part of the room, and it's what this room can give the space. And one of the first details that I knew I had to add to my house was just that, built-in bookshelves. And I remember the contractor came over and it was the first thing I had in measure. I needed a place to put my books, a permanent place. And this one corner was just bland. There was nothing there. And it was calling for something. It had a beautiful big picture window. It was next to uh, the entryway, but at the same time it was tucked into a corner. And I had enough room for two chairs if I added the shelf anyway. Anyway, it just, it just called for a bookshelf. And I've included a picture of my built-in bookshelf in, on the show notes. But it's one of those things that now the bookshelf looks like it's been there the entire duration of this house's life. It would be odd if it wasn't there. And so that's the thing. You, you, often, you can't find those pieces often that are going to just work with your house. You're going to have to customize them. And that also is what makes it feel more permanent, more homey, more secure. So if you want to take a tour of the entire reading nook space in my living room, I've linked to it. You'll need to explore becoming a top tier member to do that. I've sourced it all. I've showed the befores and the afters. Um, You can at least get a glimpse of it on the show notes today of what that bookshelf looks like. So yeah, by adding built-ins, whether it's a banquette or bookshelves or the hood for your stovetop, yeah, it's going to cost a little, probably a bit more money than if you just bought a bookshelf that you could take with you if you ever move. But your home will become a sanctuary. And it is in the intention and the eye of proportion that makes it work so perfectly in the space that's available that will reveal your good taste. So that's number seven, invest in built-ins. Number eight, last but not least, we've talked about all of this, you know, travel, understanding algorithms, investing, being brave, knowledge of yourself. The last one hopefully will give you a peace of mind. Let your taste evolve and mature. Quote, it's about letting your developing taste both inform your sense of connoisseurship, but being all right with letting that sense of taste redirect you over time to other things. As quoting Michael Diaz Griffith, who is the executive director of the Design Leadership Network. He recently wrote a book that was published this summer titled The New Antiquarians at Home with Young Collectors. Because it will take us time to experience and see all that will inform our knowledge of what good taste is and what it involves, be gentle with yourself. In other words, be open to tweaking, removing, acknowledging, and learning. Ultimately, good design makes you feel good. When you feel welcomed there and there is a sense of of respect for the space because it did take time and it wasn't something you could purchase with one click within a couple of hours and have delivered to your door, then, then you know you have good taste or you're on the road to acquiring good taste. Good taste is not acquired by the quick purchase. There will be times when you reflect and say to yourself, what was I thinking? But in the same breath, I encourage you to say, I did my best with what I knew and what I had at the time. So this is where the gentleness with yourself comes in. Your taste is going to evolve based on what you've seen, what you've experienced, what you know And as you grow into who you are, what makes you feel good, that knowledge is going to evolve and deepen with every step you take forward in your life journey. So enjoy the evolution of what good taste is. And so long as you're being conscious and paying attention, asking questions, and not just asking questions of others, but asking questions of yourself, why does that make me feel good? What is it about that texture, that fabric, that wallpaper, that piece of furniture? It's a, it's a journey of a discovery. Enjoy that. Let the evolution unfold. So 
good taste is, I think it's important to point this out too. Good, good taste is not about perfection. There's good taste. There is not perfect taste. All right. So there's a continuum and there's also a variety of different good tastes, depending again on culture, on experience and whatnot. But awareness mixed with playfulness is what makes Heidi's aesthetics clear that she understands the balance of how to involve both those concepts, but do it in a way that makes you feel at home. No room will ever be stoic as it does need to breathe. The items and furniture and fabrics will change over time, but knowing precedes why you are making the choice you are making. Thinking about proportions, thinking about complementary colors, thinking about warmth and light and how all of the concepts of design work together. Just applying and trying to apply those skills are going to create your eye for good taste. So have fun learning, experimenting, treasure hunting, and, and most of all, keep your eyes wide open, gaining glimpses and insights from those who have come before and know, just as Heidi Callier does, what good taste is all about. I do hope this has eased your mind about understanding and trusting what good taste is. And I genuinely, as I mentioned before, if you like any of the aesthetics we talked about today, a little bit of English, a little bit of a touch of modern, but marrying it with functionality and warmth and nostalgia, a bit of sophistication, I think you'll enjoy her book. If nothing else, start following her on Instagram and following her um, and check out her portfolio online. Um, it's a beautiful book. I've gained many ideas and a handful of sources too. She doesn't source everything, which of course, you got to keep some secrets to yourself. I totally get that. But the things she did source, I appreciated and I'm t- I took note. <laughs> so her book is Memories of Home. It's available now from Rizzoli by Heidi Callier, interior designer who calls home in Tacoma, Washington. All right. The show notes for today's episode are on the blog, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 365. And I'll be back with two petite plaisirs. Oh, oh, I did include a, a couple of posts from the archives, actually four posts from the archives that really explore more ideas on um, how to customize your home, but also how to understand, um, design. I included the conversation in episode from episode 346 with an uh, interior designer who lives in Paris, David Jimenez, as well as a post that I wrote sharing 10 French decor details that I include in my own home. So be sure to check those out on the show notes. All right, I'll be right back with this week's Petit Plaisir. <music> So this week's Petit Plaisir, the first Petit Plaisir, is an Anglophile find, and it is a British crime drama. I specifically like this one because there's a bit of uh, gentility about it. There's a bit of tradition about it, but there's such a likability with regards to the lead character. And I especially like season two of, and here it is, The Chelsea Detective on Acorn TV because of the chemistry between the lead detective and his partner. So Adrian Scarborough stars as D.I. Max Arnold, who takes on the crime in the London borough of Chelsea. And in season two, he has a new partner. He's partnered with Layla Walsh, who is played by Vanessa M. And what I so, I mean, I've seen Adrian Scarborough in so many different English uh, series and, and movies, mainly series. I have to say this is my favorite with him starring. He's so likable. He's imperfect but he's trying he's kind and intelligent but curious and he has his moments of being flawed but nothing nothing horrible he lives on a houseboat on this on the thames and he likes his wine he likes his piano and classical music so there you go i'm a fan and he's recently separated from his wife astrid who is an art dealer or a gallery owner And they're not officially divorced yet. So you see that relationship start to um, go back and forth a little bit in the sense of they clearly care about each other, but they also trying to start their new lives, one more than the other. And as we saw in season one, 
that's the very very beginning of season one is when they are they begin being separated. That continues into season two. All right, why I like this series uh, beyond just what I shared with you there is that number one, it's an hour and a half long, so very much in the length of Midsummer Murders, but there is only one murder and you do not see it happen. So it's not a focus on the crime, it's a focus on the characters solving the crime. And they also, uh, D.I. Uh, Max Arnold and Layla Walsh, have two other captains that work with them and support them on cases and they too have a great chemistry and are fun characters to watch as well the chief forensic officer is is deaf and her name is Ashley Wilson played by Sophie Stone and she brings a lovely comedic dry wit to the series that is so appreciated when they're piecing together all of the the evidence to solve the crime. So the series is called The Chelsea Detective. There are four episodes in each season and the second season just wrapped up this past Monday. So the four episodes of the second season are done. Hopefully it'll come back next year. I do. I actually think it will. So here is the trailer for season two or series two of The Chelsea Detective. This is a murder investigation. We're here to gather the evidence. Have you seen my new DS? This is interesting. Where did he go? We had a dead man, a robbery. What the hell is going on here? Blimey, no one's safe when Layla Walsh starts investigating. Someone has killed my husband. I suppose everyone has their breaking point. I murdered her. Do you know the answer to that, Max? Got something to hide? Whatever it is, we'll find out. Well, I know that. I was just checking if you knew that. I'm starting to sound like a real Chelsea girl. Open the door. If you don't, you'll be very expensive. Would you like a drink? Mm. You're forcing me. Suspects armed and dangerous. We're supposed to have each other's backs. Hold on! I am holding on. Shall we crack on with the case? Yeah. So as you probably heard there, the uh, trailer includes a lot of the, you know, the sensational parts of the the crime solving aspects. But what you don't catch a lot of, although there were a few glimpses, is the witty banter and playful repartee between the partners. There's a, a larger focus on Max's personal life, and he's just a very likable character Um, with unique crimes they take us into the art world they take us into the fashion world they take us into um, counseling Uh, there's just some interesting um, lifestyles that they take us into um, that and make it even more intriguing with some wonderful characters that that I think you'll recognize from other British series who not necessarily give it away as to who did it, who didn't, but they play a major role in the storytelling. So The Chelsea Detective, two seasons or series are available um, on Acorn TV. And Adrian Scarborough is the lead and the namesake um, of The Chelsea Detective. Now, the second Petit Plaisir is one for your appetite. So as we conclude summer here in the Northern Hemisphere. I shared in the most recent episode of the Simply Luxurious Kitchen cooking show how to cook and enjoy your peaches. I had scads of peaches and I won't go on and on about the peaches, just that there were a ton. But one of the simplest things to savor, and this is the first thing I made with my peaches, is a peach and blueberry tart, or as I make them, mini galettes. So no pan, just free form, small, one serving. I only need about one, maybe two peaches and a small, 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 small handful of blueberries. That is pretty much the ingredient list. It is so simple. And with fresh fruit, absolutely a wonderful combination. So let me walk you through the recipe. I'm also going to share with you with the pastry, some little tips and tricks to make it uber delicious with layers of flavor. You can watch me make this on episode two, season six of Simply Luxurious Kitchen Cooking Show with a new episode every other Saturday. So the next episode will air Saturday, September 30th. It will be a savory dish to welcome fall. And there'll be a brand new cooking episode, a video of me in the kitchen cooking away through Thanksgiving. We conclude with a holiday episode, French inspired, that I think you'll love. 
Anyway, back to our peaches. So first thing we're going to do is make our pastry. And the pastry is just a half a cup of whole wheat flour, two tablespoons of sugar, a fourth a cup of chilled unsalted butter, a sprinkle of salt, pulse that in your food processor, then add one to two tablespoons of fresh orange juice. So already we have two different concepts of ingredients to make this pastry. Oh my gosh, so good. Delicious. The whole wheat I love because it adds a bit of nuttiness and it's also a little bit healthier. And the orange juice, again, you need a binder, but instead of an egg and water, the orange juice just again adds something special to this mix. It doesn't make it too sweet. It doesn't make it too tart. It's just something extra. You impulse that, take it out, wrap it in plastic wrap, and refrigerate it for at least 30 minutes. While that is is uh, cooling or chilling, all you need to do with your peaches is to remove the skin before you put them in boiling water is score the bottom of each peach with an X. That's it. This will make it so much easier to peel. Put them into boiling hot water for 45 seconds to a minute. If the water stops boiling before after you put the peaches in, wait till it comes back to boil to start your 45 seconds. You'll start to see the peel or the skin peeling at the corners where you made the X. This tells you it's time to take them out. So you take them out after about a minute of boiling, put them immediately into a cold bath, a cold water bath or ice bath, take off the skin. Then you can also pit them, slice them in half. That's it. Just slice them in half. Do not fine slice them into, you know, little narrow slips or strips or don't even dice them. Just you want halves. Trust me on this one. Then all you do, make sure your oven's at 400 degrees. Take out the, the dough after it's been in the fridge for 30 minutes. Roll out the dough. Put the peaches half side down. I usually, I have small peaches, so I use two peaches, four halves. Put them into the middle of the, the tart or the pastry. Make sure you add blueberries around the outside edges of the blueberry, of the peaches then enclose, so you're leaving about an inch all the way around of pastry that's empty, nothing's on it. Fold it over the peaches, add more blueberries to the center of your tart, add a smidge of bl uh, brown sugar, then use egg wash to wash the pastry, sprinkle some toasted sesame seeds on the pastry, bake for 20 minutes approximately till golden brown, take it out, sprinkle with toasted um, almond slices, and enjoy with vanilla gelato or whatever you want and a cup of hot tea, of course, or whatever you want to pair it with for your hot cuppa. That is it. The marriage of the blueberries and the peaches is absolutely fantastic. I think you'll enjoy it. A peach and blueberry mini galette or double that and you get a tart. The recipe is on the show notes, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 365. And you can watch me make that recipe on episode two, season six of the simply luxurious kitchen show. I hope you've enjoyed this week's petite plaisir where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable and delicious. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Now I want to share two things with you. Uh, first of all, if you enjoy this podcast, uh, I want to thank everyone who has reviewed this show. Uh, we have more than 1,100 reviews. And this show has a 4.7 out of 5 ranking over the past 10 years. And that's all because of you. Thank you so much for tuning in, taking the time to write those reviews, for sharing what you love about this show. It means more than you know, and it helps new listeners discover if this is the show for them. If you share a review, you may just hear your review shared in a future episode or on the Simple Sophisticate Podcast Instagram uh, account where I've posted many already. Also, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I am heading to England here soon in October, and I'm going to be sharing my trip as far as um, photographs and where I'm gone and what I've been doing and what I've been enjoying on the blog, I'm really going to try to stay off social media as far as I want to be fully present during my trip. Um, of course, I'm going to take a few and share just so people know where I'm at, um, but not as much as I have in the past. And one of the main reasons why is, again, I want to be present. 
With that said, if you're a top tier member, I'm going to write three exclusive posts. I'm going to call them the, the, the Thursday travel posts, but there's three of them and, and I'm going to be gone for two weeks. So it's more than just Thursday, but these are going to be three posts where I simply just share photographs and tell you in detail what I'm doing, what I'm up to. So shared and posted while I'm still over there. So you can actually see what I'm up to and not have to wait until I get back. And these will be exclusive to top tier members. So if you've ever considered becoming a top tier member, now is a great time to do so. You can visit the blog, go to the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash member and discover all the benefits. You can enjoy ad free reading. You can enjoy all the exclusive posts and content as well as opportunities to, and this is what I'm also doing over in England. I'm meeting with a handful of top tier members who won the British week's grand giveaway. We're gathering for a high tea at a very special place in London. And people are coming from the United States and from all over England. We're just going to have a very nice, intimate gathering, doing something we all enjoy, being Anglophiles, <laughs> and, and also get engaging with each other um, in person for the first time. I'm so looking forward to not only meeting them, but having them meet each other. Um, and again, this is another benefit of being a top tier member. Um, you can only enter the giveaways if you are a top tier member. So all that information is on the blog. I will be back with a brand new episode on the Wednesday, the 4th of October. We're going to be talking about international preparation when it comes to travel um, and packing. So stay tuned for that episode 366. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. And wishing you a wonderful conclusion to the month of September. And thank you for tuning in. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co or the simply luxurious life.com for more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique simply luxurious life pick up my new book which became both a bestseller and number one new release in france travel the road to le papillon daily meditations on true contentment available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening my first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access, and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Cup of Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Ables. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour.